Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I am going to try and replicate the New Horizons launch vehicle. Yes, this, of course, is highly pertinent since it is finally arriving at its destination. So this is using the real scale solar system install that I was demoing a few days ago. Uh, I've added a few other parts here, but much of the spacecraft is made of procedural parts. We're trying to use realistic fuels wherever possible, but there's a few bits here and there that aren't quite right. Regardless, let's get this thing going. Now, the New Horizons spacecraft was the first spacecraft, I believe, that was launched immediately onto a solar system escape trajectory. That meant that after it had finished firing its all three stages, it was leaving the solar system at escape velocity. Now, it picked up a gravity assist to Jupiter, but the point was that when this left Earth, it had spent more Delta V than anything else. The developers of the New Horizon spacecraft went for the lightest design that they could manage. The whole thing weighs something like 400 kilograms. And for comparison, if you know the Galileo or the Cassini missions, they both had little sub-probes that landed. One went into Jupiter's atmosphere and the other landed on Titan. Those probes were almost the same size as the entire New Horizon spacecraft. So. You know, this is a this is a very small spacecraft, but of course small means light, which means lots of delta V. Now they put it on an Atlas V with five external boosters. This was the first time they flew the Atlas V with this many boosters. It was the largest payload they could get. The only way they could get bigger than this was to go with a Delta IV Heavy, and that was far too cost prohibitive. Now, my model breaks down a little because those external boosters actually burned for less time, but they had roughly the right thrust early on. I'm sure I will regret it later on. Anyway, regardless, the whole thing continues. Now, the first stage on the Atlas V runs off kerosene and liquid oxygen. It's 3.8 meters across and it feeds the RD-180 engine, which is a Russian engine. And it is one of the best performing engines in the world. It has two combustion chambers which basically share a, a single turbo pump. When it debuted, it had the highest thrust to weight ratio of any engine at the time. And it is a closed cycle engine. It has since been beaten by the, the Merlin engine on the Falcon 9. But the Merlin engine isn't nearly as efficient as this thing. Anyway, we're approaching stage burnout here. What happens at this point is we throttle back the engines to make sure we don't accelerate too hard because accelerating too fast can cause the tanks to fail. So you throttle it down. And then it's time for the second stage to do its thing, except I'm told that the engine is suffering from vapour in the feed lines and shuts down. Now this is something from Realism Mod. If you've ever heard the term eulage thruster, well this is what this is all about. When the fuel is sitting in the fuel tank and you go into zero G, it starts kind of floating around and you get voids and vacuums or whatever inside it. Well what you have typically is a couple of thrusters to just give it a slight push to make sure the fuel settles towards the back of the tank so you can start pumping it out. And that is a real thing that has to be done, and obviously the realism mod people decided to make sure it was added. In real rockets, some of the engines will have specific thrusters that are just for this purpose. If later on, though, you'll get the reaction control system which will actually fulfill this purpose for it. Anyway, this is a standard upper stage Centaur rocket. It runs on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. As you know, liquid hydrogen is very low density, but it is high specific impulse. So what, what you have is a very high efficiency upper stage here. Now the Centaur is a classic piece of space hardware. The first launch of a Centaur with a Centaur upper stage was in 1962. And it has pretty much directly evolved. The current versions are a direct evolution of those original Centaurs launched over 50 years ago. Anyway, initially this upper stage is just to get the spacecraft into orbit and that's what I do here. I miss my shutoff by a fraction of a second and slightly uh, give myself a slightly eccentric orbit, but it doesn't matter. We now have to wait for the appropriate time to perform our escape burn and head off towards Jupiter. <laughs> 
So after a systems check in low earth orbit, we're ready to fire up the engine again. Once again, we per perform a eulage burn using the reaction control system in the center or upper stage. Watch, the propellant goes from very unstable to unstable, risky, or very ris risky, risky, very stable, and I can fire the engines now. So I just throttle up, and there we go. So once that's firing, obviously the acceleration of the engines is sufficient to keep the uh, fuel all the way down. Uh, apparently, you only need about, you know, a tiny fraction of a G to make sure that the fuel all the, sits nicely at the bottom of the tank before you can fire the main engines. You just need to make sure you have some way to do it. Other spacecraft use different pressurization or different fuel systems. Some have membranes inside the tanks. Others are rotating spacecraft, and so therefore they have uh, a natural uh, orientation, or the, the fuel tanks will drain outwards. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways of dealing with this problem, but mostly in Kerbal Space Program, you haven't had to think about what happens, how the fuel gets to your engines in zero G when there's no way for the fuel to drain downwards. Anyway, in the New Horizons mission, the Centaur upper stage did achieve escape velocity from the sphere of influence of the Earth. And in fact, it is now in a helio heliocentric orbit. It goes out about as far as the inner asteroid belt and then comes back. It didn't obviously achieve escape velocity from the solar system. Anyway, that burns out, and now it's time for us to fire up the next stage. And this was a little problematic in this case. But nothing some staging can't sort out, albeit a little explosively. Anyway, we're free to navigate and we have the final upper stage, which in this case, the final stage was a solid rocket booster in the form of a, a Star 48B, which is a pretty standard uh, you know, final kicker stage. It has a four feet wide, that's what the 48 refers to, 48 inches, and uh, it provides basically a few kilometers per second of delta v in this case now why you would put I, I obviously in kerbal space program i normally advise against using an upper stage with solid rocket boosters because the specific impulse of solid rocket boosters is so terrible but the reason why you would use an upper stage based on this is because it is very reliable and engineers building rockets like things to be reliable and reliable it was. It, of course, pushed the spacecraft up to its escape velocity, uh, except in my case I clearly made some mistakes somewhere in my calculations and it didn't quite achieve escape velocity from the solar system. Regardless, the real one did. In fact, it worked a little too well. After the final burnout of that stage, they discovered they were moving a couple of meters per second too fast, so they have to use the probes on board engines to make course corrections. So they slowed the thing down using the on board systems, which use hypergolic fuel. And uh, as a result, the booster stage reached Jupiter before the space probe itself, where they made a gravity assist at Jupiter before flying off towards Pluto. As it turned out, if they had missed their launch window by about a month, then they could still get to Pluto. It would just take about five years longer without the gravity assist from Jupiter. But on Tuesday, it will arrive after almost a decade in flight. It is going to be zipping through the Plutonian system, going too fast to stop. It will be sciencing the heck out of Pluto and its four or five moons, everything it can. During the encounter, it is unable to transmit data back because they're trying to maximize the amount of science they get. Uh, so they will get pictures later on in the day, but not until after the encounter has primarily, is essentially over. Yes, it's very hard to get science from Pluto. You need to send it across hours and hours of light delay. The energies are very, very low. You need the biggest dishes and you need a lot of power from the spacecraft, which has to hold very still, which is why we will be waiting a long time to actually get the fruits of this flyby, as they say. So anyway, here's hoping to a great week with lots of science. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.